This week on Three Sides of the Coin, Lisa's dealing with a hamster and Mark's dealing with a crab. So, <laughs> so you just got... <laughs> On three sides. Yeah, that's a typical three sides episode. Um, so you got Mike and Tommy and our special third guest this week, Ron Keel is back. What a riveting conversation with Ron Keel this week. Mm -hmm. And we both got to speak a little bit, finally, because Mark's not here. It was kind of cool. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things... Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. You got two coins this week. Michael Branville, Tommy Summers. We did invite Lisa, but allow me to read Lisa's <laughs> excuse here as to why she couldn't show up. Right. This is going to be the new hummingbird. <laughs> Yep, totally, totally so. so she wrote, we're having a bit of an issue with a hamster. Right there, I'm just like, oh, God, okay. She crawled under the cabinets and she dug a hole in the back wall. We're trying to get her out. So Lisa's not here because there's a hamster escaped in her house. I don't know if that's code for something between yeah, her and Brian. Something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but Lisa's not here because of a hamster, <laughs> and Mark is not here because of a crab. <laughs> not the little ones that crawl on you, on you that make you yeah. itch. <laughs> the big ones that they serve at seafood buffets. Because Mark, flu Mark flew to Florida today and literally sent us a photo of the first plate of crab legs that they brought out to him and he's probably by now on to about what's the that this will be a very first homework question how many plates of crab legs did mark eat today i'm gonna and go with six. two hours later i'm gonna go with six. Oh, okay um god that's a really good choice um do he is it did he text us the, or did he send the picture in that thread on facebook yes yes he did okay see it um i gotta look at this guy's there, it's snow here. crab legs it's not king crab yes. snow crab a little smaller a little easier oh. to break into and open i'm gonna go seven plates okay so your yeah. homework question first homework question people how many plates of crab legs did mark kill today instead of coming on the show we've got six yes. by me seven by tommy yeah so and, and 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 i will i will tell you this mark did say before he sent that photo he was hungry <laughs> <laughs> that's a key piece yeah. of this puzzle here he's hungry he actually didn't eat on the plane so you know <laughs> God. Oh, Mark boy. Mark and seafood, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, all right. So before we get into this week's amazing guest, a couple, couple things we want to um, chat about real quick. So I wanted to read um, – oh, let me pull up. The, I should have had this note ready beforehand. Uh, where is it? Okay. So a few weeks ago, we did a show with uh, Justin Reich, who produced the Fire and Water video for uh -huh. Ace Fraley. And yep. Eddie Trunk had listened to it and sent us an email, uh, some insights that he said we could share. So I thought I would read this, and I found it very interesting. So this Thank you, from, Eddie. This is from Eddie. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the insights. Listen to the podcast with with Justin, who did the video. Great stuff. A few things you might want to share with your listeners that might be of interest. He kept stressing how little time he had, but never gave the reason, which was because Paul committed to doing the video on very short notice, and he had a super small window to do it in because he had a surgery scheduled. I believe rotator cuff is what Eddie said, right after the shoot date. So... It was a now or never deal from his end on the schedule. Ace was on the road at the same time and actually in Florida the night before the shoot 
I was with him, Eddie said. He played a festival date the night before in South Florida, so he took a 6 a.m. cross country to make it to L.A. in time, day of. So he literally landed the day of. The last big factor was the absence of Richie Scarlett, who was in the band at the time. That was a real tough behind-the-scenes decision and obviously tough for Richie, but he took it okay. The reason being they didn't want three guitar players in the video and also a bit of concern that because Richie was so animated on stage, Paul might be put off by it. Uh, he, he ends by saying, I think Paul's voice on that song is the best vocal in a long time. Tackling Paul Rogers is no easy feat. So there's a little insight, a little more insight to yeah. the to the video. Um, it's, and I love getting I love getting stuff like this because it just fills in a few more holes and paints a little right. bit more of the picture for all of us. Well, and a big thank you to Eddie for taking the time to share that with us because it's all stuff we didn't know. So it was very nice of him. Yep, yep. Um, I want to do a real quick shout out, even though Mark is in a food coma right now. Uh, make sure you're checking out Left for Dead, people. Getting mm -hmm. a lot of it, it, it's approaching 5,000 views on the video. Uh, some great reviews are coming in. Get this even Dr. Fuck loved Left for Dead. Wow, that's crazy. Now, did he he's say that just to try and get back on our good side? No, I think he's actually being very genuine. You think so? Mm hmm. Yeah. I think so. Anyway, Dr. Fuck, Ralph loves Left for Dead. So go check it out. You can find Left for Dead um, on any of the streaming digital services out there. There's no physical goods right now. Some people have been asking about the physical on-demand CDs from Amazon. Hold Up is on Amazon's end um, because of all the crap that's going on in the world. Amazon yeah. is is weeks behind on getting their on-demands set up for cd printing um but it will come but right now if you need a digital download head over to itunes google play amazon music's got it um or you can stream it on apple music spotify deezer wherever you wherever you listen to your music you can find it um i think we need to take them well here before we do this we weren't here we didn't have a show last week and we we posted why on Facebook and on our socials, but I'm sure there's obviously a lot of people who don't follow us on social media who are wondering where the show went. Um, right. First of all, I would always encourage you, follow us on one of the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You don't have to be on all of them, but that's where we're going to post updates and news and stuff like this. Um, mm -hmm. So last week we weren't here because the week prior... Remember, we record on a Tuesday and release a week later. The music industry basically um, went black for 24 hours in support of everything that's going on. And, and I mean, like everybody in the music industry didn't work that day. And, uh, you know, I brought, it, I brought it up to Tommy and I was like, you know, I kind of feel like I, I want to do this. I should do this because... I work in the music industry, but I do understand that, you know, we're a podcast. We're not exactly the music industry. If we want to record, we can record. Um, coincidentally, <clears throat> at the same time, the guest we had scheduled needed to be rescheduled. So we had we had a, an opening in the show. We kind of all agreed, all three of us, let's just take it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um and I, I actually want to say, okay, so check this out. Yes. We got the coolest gifts in the mail um, from Mark Griffith. Griffin. Yes. Sorry. Um, he is a firefighter in Philadelphia, which ties into all of this because I support first responders. I support our police. Um, and with everything that's going on right now, it's been really hard, especially in Minneapolis over the last couple of weeks. Uh, those of you that I'm friends with on Facebook know what I'm talking about because I've been out taking pictures and writing stories because I'm watching my city burn. 
And <clears throat> I've had several people say to me, it's like, they've said to me, you have a voice because of the podcast and the different things that you do. And I thought about it for a while and I'm like, well, I don't know if I do or I don't, but I think that it's important that we as a nation and we as a human race, I don't care where you live, should support freedom for everybody. And it doesn't matter whether you're um, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, uh, none of that stuff should matter. Everyone should be able to, to be on an equal playing field. And I do believe that education is the great equalizer. Because if you have two people, regardless of their backgrounds, that have the same education, they should theoretically have the same opportunity to better themselves. And I just think that it's an important issue that, that all of us should at least have a conversation about. I'm not going to try and tell you what you should or shouldn't do or should, and should, should or shouldn't think, but I'm hoping that our sophisticated audience, because I feel like you guys are, will take the time to see what's going on and seek truth and answers for yourself. Don't believe everything you hear in the media. Don't believe everything that you read in the newspaper because some of that stuff may or may not be true. So instead of getting angry with someone and refusing to speak to them to hear your point of view or for you to listen to theirs, go out of your way to listen to what someone else has to say. And when you hear something, whether you believe it or not or you agree with it or not, look to see if you can figure out if it's true. Uh, that, that's my advice. Yeah. I, you know, I think one thing that's been pretty clear about this show from day one is we've, we've avoided getting political. This, yeah. is a, this is about us just talking rock and roll and music and kiss. And first thing I want to say is don't take this as an opportunity to get political because we're not yeah. getting political right now. We just no. did this because individually we, we felt like we just wanted to do it. Um, you know, we didn't make any big statements. We don't get up and preach about all this stuff. I mean, we might individually, personally, that's fine. But as a show, we don't do that. And that's not what this is about. Right. We just felt right. like we needed to do something to to join in the show that we're at least thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all I'm saying is, is please consider someone else's opinion that may not agree with yours and hear what they have to say because that's what's going to make things different is, is when we can start talking again yeah so exactly. that's all i've got to say exactly so um let's move on to this week's guest as we find out it was four years ago when he last was here because he's which, got all the data he saved all like, the data I know, which blows my mind. He's, I, I he's, like, he's like Gene Simmons. He knows all of this stuff. Yeah, um, we, we are joined, returning, great honor, Ron Keel is back. Um, we talk some Kiss. We talk a lot of rock and roll. We talk a lot of uh, vocal skills, singing skills, um, training um, we talk about his new album, South by South Dakota, and the great influence Southern Rock has had on his career for decades. Um, you know, I, I'll, I said this at the end of the show, and I'll just repeat it up front here. Over the last, I don't know, six to eight weeks, we've had some amazing guests who were storytellers join us. Ted Nugent, yes. fascinating discussion. Dennis DeYoung, fascinating discussion. And I will throw Ron Keel in with those two. Yeah. They just all shared some amazing stories. They, they know how to speak. They speak with passion. Um, and they pull you in. And I was just riveted by this conversation with Ron this week. Yeah. I was too. And, and I love to learn new things. And hopefully you guys that are listening will enjoy this as well and um, enjoy the conversation. Yeah. So Ron, let it roll. Ron Keel.
Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. The metal cowboy himself. Look at these beautiful people. How are you, Ron? I am good. How are you guys doing? Good. Really good. Really good. What What's the good. backdrop behind you? Metal this cowboy. This is uh, my metal cowboy shower curtain. It's a bootleg shower curtain. <laughs> you know you've hit it big when they're bootlegging your logo on a shower curtain. <laughs> I had to cover up the I had to cover up the green screen, which I used for some Zoom interviews earlier. And yeah. that, uh, of course, you can choose the virtual background. I put the album cover up there and all that. But so I hung the shower curtain, for, especially for you guys. Oh, nice. awesome. awesome! I like it. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm only dreaming of the day that we'll have a bootleg three sides of the coin shower curtain. I'm not the only one who has one too. There's some some kiloholics that actually have them and use them in their showers. I use mine for a backdrop. Well, you've got hardcore fans, dude. They love you. Yeah, and I love them too, man. That's uh, yeah, very gratifying. You're, you're really blessed. You are blessed. Absolutely. You know? no, I feel that. I feel that way uh, as well. Thank you. So, so guys, let's just roll with this. This doesn't go out live, obviously, Ron. But let's just start. Let's start chatting here. I think, you know what? I mean, we've had you on before, and I encourage all of our listeners to check out your first appearance. Yeah, um, I do have the stats. So, excuse me, Michael. Didn't mean to interrupt you, but I do have the stats on that. It's been four years. Oh my god. I appeared on uh, three sides of the coin. That was April 26th, 2016. And it, I Jesus. spoke. I spoke with you guys for an hour and 47 minutes. And I definitely needed a cocktail when that one was done. And we've had 13,059 views on that previous oh. appearance on three sides of the coin. So I hope to top that today. I don't want to top the hour and 52 minutes or anything, but no. hopefully top the viewers. Dude, dude, I'm I'm impressed with all those stats. I don't even keep track of stuff like that. <laughs> well, I had to I had to check it out to make sure, because I knew, I remember it was a really long discussion, and I did it at my office yep. when I had an, an office uh, at the Badlands. And I remember it was just an hour and, and almost two hours worth of, the show itself is over two hours long, but you guys brought me in. At about the 16-minute yep. mark, yep, and there was 13 minutes left after I got done uh, spewing whatever it was that I I didn't watch the whole thing again, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't wear the same thing <laughs> for this interview that I was wearing four years ago. Uh, I almost well, did. That does that. I actually had that same vest on earlier for interviews because it's one of my favorites. I never wear it on stage. It's not all stinky. It's a really nice custom vest. I thought, well, I'll wear this today for my interviews. So then I checked out my three sides of the coin appearance from April of uh, 2016, and I realized I'm wearing that vest. I can't. I just took the vest off, and you get the T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you should have worn it again. That would have been great. You know? <laughs> it's, it's right upstairs. It's laying on the bed, uh, of course. But uh, in these days of, and you guys set the bar pretty high for that. These interactive Skype and Zoom interviews. We're doing a lot of those now, and I hope the fans enjoy it. Uh, I certainly enjoyed my last time with you guys, and I'm enjoying being able to uh, express myself in this on this platform with uh, a lot of Zoom interviews. Uh, you have to actually uh, you have to put clothes on. Well, at least from yeah. the waist up. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'm not standing up during this interview. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so Ron, because this is a Kiss podcast, let's talk a little bit about Kiss right away so the fans our listeners don't yell at us and go what the hell this is a kiss podcast i why am i listening to we get that anyway but um when we're done talking about kiss i want to just talk kind of music and rock and roll with you i mean you're whatever you, you want you, I'm you're, all you're, you're kind of the expert in all of that you've been you've lived it you're still living it well i have a good personal trainer his name is michael Brandwell, and he works my ass off at least six hours a day and he really is, Tommy. He's like a personal trainer for the listeners and viewers that don't know. Michael Brandbold is now in charge of our digital marketing, uh, consulting, uh, whatever you want to call yourself. But it's a jack of all trades, really, um, in terms of our live streaming, our music, uh, the digital presence, the social media presence, all that stuff. And Michael will load me up with uh, 
Continually, every day. Yep, emails, it's emails, just, emails. It's very much like a personal trainer. You hate doing it, but you got to do what he tells you if you want to get in shape. And 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 just and, a, a heads up, I don't forget because when I send out an email, then I I log a a reminder like a week later to go. Okay, if I haven't heard from this, I'm gonna check in. <laughs> right, I got to set a I got to set a reminder to remind myself to set those reminders. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Right. Great advice, but you know, he, Michael does do a brilliant job. I mean, a part of, a big piece of the reason why we've had success here is because of Michael's hard work of yeah. getting us. Yeah, no, Tommy, it's because they hate time. me so much. Well, there's that too, but that's just the, that's the icing on the cake, <laughs> you know. And then also too, I mean, you've done an incredible job with Mark's band, Left for Dead, and their new album, getting a lot of spins and a lot of. Uh, of press and, and attention so I'll, you know what ron i'm gonna i'll send you i'll send you a copy of mark mark's um album left for dead um do. You'll, you'll love it it's just great old school classic heavy metal influenced by motorhead and the entire this new is, wave of british metal mark who mark Cicchini? Cicchini. Cicchini, yep. yeah yeah, yeah i knew i was gonna screw his name he's, up he's, because... he's, not, he's not here with us this week because literally right now as we are talking, he is at an all-you-can-eat snow crab buffet in Florida, oh, and we don't we, we don't rate when it comes to a snow crab buffet for Mark. No, no not that at all. Great. That's a valid excuse for missing class. Uh, and, and and in all seriousness, Ron, if you own stock in seafood, Mark's going to destroy the seafood supply in Florida. Well, he's got yeah. good taste and. Uh, I look forward to hearing his new record, Left for Dead. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Um, and you want to talk yeah, Kiss, good. man. Good. I love I love talking right. Kiss. Yeah. Of course, yeah. even even the non Kiss focused um, interviews and hosts that I talk to always want to ask about Gene, my relationship with Gene and Paul, and what he meant to me, uh, both as a friend and as a mentor, as a producer, and all that. So uh, very happy to be a, a very tiny thread in that huge tapestry that is the legend of Kiss. And it brought guys like you into my life. You know, we got to hang out at various Kiss Expos, and, yep. and uh, I think that's where I met you. And being a part of those events has been fantastic, on top of having Gene's name on my first two major label albums, which really you know, put us on the map. For sure. Yeah. So, so, so l yeah. L let, me, let me ask you, for, from a, a story memory standpoint, as a Kiss fan, not as somebody who's been in the business and worked with people like Gene, but just as a pure Kiss fan, what is your greatest Kiss fan memory? Wow. It's got to be the first concert. I think many of us of our generation, Kiss was the first band that we saw in concert. And I didn't, my parents wouldn't let me go to a rock concert until I was old enough to drive myself. They wouldn't take me. You know, if we're not taking you, you get a car, you can go wherever the hell you want. So I actually had just gotten my license, and KISS was playing at Tarrant County Convention Center in Dallas. This was the Love Gun Tour, I believe. Styx was the opening act. And uh, to experience that arena for the first time, how, how better to do that than with the spectacle that it is KISS, being the tallest guy or the biggest guy. You know, I was still 6'4 at the time, even though I was only 16 years old, so... I fought my way to the to the front row. A couple of the guys in the football team that were in my band actually were with me. So we fought our way to the front row. It was all general admission back then. And the experience was obviously even even sticks to see the opening band. Dennis DeYoung was the first guy I ever saw sing in an arena. And uh, but when Kiss came out with the, that huge uh, explosive production, it was it blew me away. And, and to be in the front row and, and feeling the heat of the flames when Gene blew fire to get his blood and spit and sweat on me. Uh, it was a, amazing to experience seven years later, just seven years after that, I was in a hotel room at the Beverly Hills Hotel with Gene Simmons, spitting in his face, singing The Right to Rock, because we did, we had a demo tape with no vocal on it. Famous story. I tell this one all the Stop me if you've heard this one before. No, go, but, go, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the cassette tape that we only had one song and it was just the music just a basic jam of the song the right to rock so i put it in his boom box 
in his hotel room. And I'm sp I spit when I sing. I'm spitting all over the, the screen right now as we as I speak. I can't I can't talk or sing without spitting. And Gene's sitting across from me. Uh, you know, we're sitting these two beds, two queen beds, and he's on one side of one, and I'm on the side of the other. And I'm just sc screaming the right to rock in his face, and he's getting my spit on him now. And he hits stop on the player. And he said, "I'm going to produce this record, and we're going to start Tuesday." Uh, wow. Another huge moment in, in, unlike many Kiss fans, I didn't see the makeup before I heard the music. I heard the music first. And right. usually your first impression of Kiss was the look, the yeah. image, the, yep. the characters. A friend of mine in school was playing the cassette tape of that first Kiss album. And I, he didn't have the jacket. He was just playing the cassette on his little portable cassette player. And I thought it was just amazing. The primal energy, the song, Strutter Deuce. I just thought it was cool as hell. And I had no idea. I'm pretty sure it was Don Kirshner's rock concert. You guys are the Kiss uh, trivia masters. But I think it was Don Kirshner's rock concert when they uh, they came out and played Firehouse. And I got to see them. I stayed up late to watch them on TV. And that, at the time, was I had no idea about the look, the show, the production. A huge influence on me even before I met Gene or was able to work with him and meet Paul and hang with all the members of KISS uh, was the fact that they were putting on a show. And I tried to do that with all of my bands when I was a kid. I mean, we had the, the coffee cans with gunpowder in them and you throw a match in there and it's pyro. Uh, I, I, just, I just always thought that you got to put on a show, right? Because that's the first rock concert I ever saw. That's yeah. how it's done. You know, you gotta you gotta dress up and you gotta be larger than life and and put on a show. So that influence certainly uh, has been a cornerstone of my life, my career, and every show that I do. So let me let me ask you then, since you first were exposed to Kiss, hearing the music, and then you saw them, do you remember your reaction when you? first saw the visual, the look of it? Because, you know, there was no other bands remotely like Kiss at that time. No. So well, it was a huge departure from anything, even hard rock and metal that was going on. What was going through your head when you're like, wait a second, this is what these guys look like? Well, for me, growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, Alice Cooper, you know, that's his hometown. Yeah. He was huge. I played in a band with Michael Bruce's brother, Paul Bruce. Michael Bruce is the original yeah. guitar player from the Alice Cooper band. And I played in a band with his younger brother, Paul. So I got to meet Michael when I was 14 years old. And the Alice Cooper, you know, Al Alice ruled that city. He was the big, huge megastar that had made it out of my hometown and was also into, obviously, the theatrical side of rock and roll. And... So to me, Kiss was, it wasn't, it was different because it's all four guys. Kind of like right. you know, that, 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 that the team of, of guys instead of just Alice out front and the band behind him. Like the uh, Beatles. Exactly. Great comparison. And that uh, obviously took it to the next level. I never, uh, never was in a Kiss tribute band or, or anything like that. I, I, I Never, I used to do the Alice Cooper makeup on Halloween because it was easy and cheap. Right. And I'm tall. I had long, I had long black hair, and I'm tall. I was skinny at the time. So I'd put on the Alice Cooper makeup at Halloween. That's all I would do. And I'd go into a bar and win first place in the Halloween contest and drink for free. So that, I nice. did put on the Alice Cooper makeup more than once, but I never did the kiss. How about you, Tommy? Have you ever done the kiss makeup on yourself? Yeah, when we were kids. <laughs> Uh, when we were kids, we would lip sync to the records and we would invite all of the neighborhood there and we would set up chairs in the driveway and we would use the garage as the stage. Awesome. How about you, Mike? You ever do the kids makeup? I've done it, honestly, only once in my entire life and it wasn't when I was a kid. It was years after I'd graduated and I was working a real corporate job at a advertising department for a home improvement chain where I was managing their computer network. It was Halloween. Companies have, you know, the company Halloween. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to really freak the hell out of people. I'm going to do Gene Simmons. And I did Gene from Dress to Kill. So I put a suit on because I normally would never wear a suit and tie. I didn't have to. I put a suit yeah. and tie on. I did the makeup. I borrowed 
big black wig, and I spent the whole day as Gene Simmons. And let me tell you, there were so many strange looks from the corporate executives like, I bet. It's probably a good thing they didn't recognize who I was. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's kind of like wearing the mask these days. You can get away with you know, just about anything. Exactly. Uh, I, uh, Shit. I can only imagine... You know what, what that's like. I, I went through the 80s, of course, and it was a two hour prep period for me from being Ron Keel to being Ron Keel. So it was yeah. a lot of makeup and a lot, a lot of the hair. There was a ritual to do with the hair and every leather wristband and every piece of jewelry and the gloves and the, all the stuff that you strap onto yourself. It was a two hour ordeal to get dressed for, for the gig back in the day. Now I can do it in 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> But I want to take you back to that time, though, because one of the things I'm meaning to ask you is when you're first starting out and you're signed and you're doing this record and Gene's producing it, are you looking around at your other contemporaries and thinking, I want to do what they're doing? Or was how you guys dressed and looked more of just a natural evolution that happened to be similar amongst a lot of other bands in the in that era great question and the keel look if you look back on even the right to rock album cover sessions we did the, the two photo sessions the same day and we did the album cover which is the back cover with the mannequins and the i'm wearing this red leather and red and white leather thing and it was a little more i guess that's why why or how we got categorized as glam or hairband or whatever. And, but then when it was time to do the promo photo for a and Records, the, the photo that goes out to all the media and the press, we changed clothes and were more down to earth. I mean, more jeans, T-shirts, uh, le leather boots. And, you know, I was wearing a, uh, a leather vest with uh, blue jeans. And so for much of Keel's history, there was that element of, you know, the street. The street was a big part of who we were and what we did. Denim and leather, you know, the Saxon anthem was more than just a song or an album. It was a way of life for us. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, people at the record company actually told us what to wear for the album cover. They okay. literally picked out, you're going to wear red. You, you, Because I wore red. I think it was a big show we, we did in L.A. and the record company was there. And they thought it looked really, you know, of this big tall guy wearing this red leather stuff and they thought it was cool and they mandated on the album cover you're wearing the red outfit uh, so it was red leather pants and uh red let, let, shirt let, let, let me back. ask you ron so well, when the when the record label mandates and says that to you do you think to yourself no or did you just like okay they must know more than i do so i'll just go along with it I didn't object to it. If I had objected to it, I might have said something. But at the time, you know, there was a lot of good decisions being made. The decision to bring Gene Simmons in was was one of those brilliant decisions that, that I was offered the opportunity to work with Gene. They did give us, we said, look, if we're going to do, we're signed now, right? We need somebody for clothes. Right. So the label gave us 90 bucks each. That was our wow. wardrobe allotment for the Right to Rock album cover. I already had the other stuff. I think I borrowed the white vest from, from somebody or the white white jacket. But they they gave us 90 bucks a piece, all right? And that's all you got to go out. So we, we had the guys in Keel. We got on Hollywood Boulevard. We're shopping at all these rock shops on Hollywood Boulevard. And all you could really afford with 90 bucks was a really cool pair of boots. So we each bought these. I've had leopard skin boots, and this guy had black leather boots, whatever. So we all bought these boots. And that's really all we had. We had the, more, more the stage clothes or whatever we we had. Uh, I had the red outfit already, but I, in the in the photo, if you notice, I don't have the the posters hanging on the wall in the other room. But in the photo, they flooded the floor with dry ice, and yep. the dry ice just comes up to about our shins. You don't see any boots in the photo at all. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, and, and I guess one of the reasons I asked that question is because I, I remember looking at the records when they would come out, you know, and you take these home and you, you set them up against all these other bands. And you guys always had us. I, I thought you always had like a sense of style that fit in to the times, but you never let it get ridiculous. You know, like to me, the Asylum era of Kiss with some of those videos, those yeah. literally got ridiculous. And you finally, know. finally, Tommy, when we could afford 
the really nice, flashy custom outfits was 87 uh, on the self-titled album. The, the album with Somebody's Waiting in the United Nations, where we're all standing on the front cover of the album. It's the first time the band had been shown on an album cover. And we spent, I think, 15 grand a piece or wow. something on these. Flat, Ray Brown was the guy who made clothes for Judas Priest, Motley yeah. Crue, so forth. And Ray Brown made these custom outfits for us. We designed what we want. I want leopard skin here and lace here and torn jagged stuff here. He made these really cool outfits, which were absolutely awesome and made us look just like everybody else and literally by by then by 87 you couldn't tell those bands apart the videos were all directed by the same guys they're all doing these yep. quick clips and you know, the, the videos were, were very similar and the outfits were very similar and i think it was part of the downfall is because people couldn't identify with with any one particular band anymore and then guns and roses came along and changed the whole uh the whole spectrum of what a band could and maybe should should look like. Well, and that's the thing that's still kind of confusing to me, and it's no rub on on Guns N' Roses, but I, I would disagree that people couldn't tell the difference because you had the songs, the music was there. I can't say the same about some of your contemporaries from my point of view. You were still at least very original versus it feels like once Poison hit, for instance. Then you had five other bands that sounded and looked just like them. It was more of a cookie cutter thing. Same with Guns N' Roses. I just don't understand, and I'm not taking away anything from Guns N' Roses, I still don't understand why they got so incredibly over-the-top popular I mean, they've got really, they've got some really good songs, but I think there were some other bands, yours included, that had some great songs as well that didn't quite get the same attention. Well, was, you know, it, it's kind of different for us because I feel like some of those bands that you mentioned, and some of the bands you like, the Poison, Molly Crew, uh, some of those bands had, I think, their best songs on their debut albums. Those first, the first few Poison yep. singles, just amazing songs. And on The Right to Rock, I think we had really one good song, and it was The Right to Rock. Okay. Our, song, our songwriting got better with each album. The Final Frontier was a huge step up for us in terms of uh, songwriting skills and ability to craft a good song. And then with the third album, Somebody's Waiting, songs like Cherry Lane, I Said the Wrong Thing to the Right Girl, which were not singles, are still a huge part of the Ron Keel Band show today. And they're fan favorites. They were never released as singles. We only had one single off of each record. They never did like the follow-up single or Tears of Fire, The Power of Ballad from Final Frontier did really well for us as a second single, but it didn't get hardly any push. We had a very limited budget for the video, which is arguably the, the best Keel video ever because it's natural. It was real. It was on the road. And uh, I think we, we're, I'm still always trying to evolve as a songwriter. I think that, uh, the Metal Cowboy record that I released in 2014 and the Fight Like a Band album that the Ron Keel Band released last year contain, in my opinion, the best songs of my career. So I've always tried to improve or get better and continue practicing, be a better singer, and being a, a better songwriter, I think is important. Yeah. Uh, let me well, and, and back in those days, well, maybe not so much in the late 80s or into the 90s, it seemed like with, like, take Alice Cooper. I think the first couple of records were nowhere near as good as they became or he became later on. The The label seemed like they gave you the opportunity to grow and become better versus once you hit around late 80s, it seemed like you had to have a 10 million selling record or they kind of want to push you off to the side. At least that's yeah. my perspective as a fan. Yeah, that's in 87 with that self-titled album, if we didn't go five times platinum, we're going to lose our ass. The label had invested so much money. It's like it, it's $150,000 in a day to do a music video. And it was commonplace at the time. Yeah. Now now we could do a hell of a lot with 150 grand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I could hire Mike Bradwell. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Ron, Ron, back to songwriting. You know, they, you know, they always say, you've got your whole life to write your first album and then you've got one year to write the second album. And as a songwriter, what, what, what influences you? What pushes you to write that song that, that still in, at least for you feels like it's, it's fresh, that it's honest, that it's real, 
that you're not writing a song trying to be what you think the market wants from you. And and by that, I mean, my, the example I always give is is like on the last couple Kiss albums that, that they did, it's like, I have a hard time believing some of the lyrics because these guys are 60 plus years old. They're rich, comfortable. They have families. You can't really sing about a groupie when you're 60 years old and you're in love with your wife and you've got four kids. So as a fan, and maybe I'm reading into it more than most fans would, I can't connect with that song because... You know, when they wrote Room Service and that first came out, okay, that fit what was yeah. going on with that band at that point in time. They were young kids. They were eager. They were hungry. They were tasting all of the, the successes that were starting to come that way. But 40 years later, you can't do that. That's a tough call and a great uh, observation because Kiss lyrics were – predominantly built upon sexual content and sexual innuendo. Gene was all about that. He had a notebook full of sexual phrases with sexual connotations, innuendo, right? Uh, and literally he would take those phrases and find phrases that rhymed and create a lyric or a song out of them. For me personally, and I love put the X in sex. I think it's brilliant. But the, the Kiss songs that have resonated with me and I think will resonate for decades and generations to come are those rock anthems like Rock and Roll All Night, Say Yeah, Crazy Nights, yeah. uh, Psycho Circus. Uh, some of those those tracks, I think, are those are the ones that are really timeless. And you got to realize that when young people hear a song, they want to pretend like they're the ones singing it. And I think Gene and Paul have given them that illusion, kind of like a superhero. They want to think that they can fly or they can... Uh, breathe fire so it's it is tough and you asked me about my approach to it and I have a very I have a very balanced approach to songwriting I'm in a creative phase right now because we've had this pandemic I've been off the road since we left Australia in March I wanted to use some of this time in, in addition to working the new album South by South Dakota it's important to spend some of this time at home being creative and I I, I approach it in two different ways one is a a method where I've got my list of titles and phrases and I've got a, a huge catalog of riffs and musical ideas that I've created or and, and then I sit and I'll try and assemble them and try and see which kind of like magnets which music gravitates to which lyric it's very tough because the last album that I wrote by like a band was extremely personal and I did have a uh, strong subject matter to draw from with what my wife and I were going through at the time. As she was battling cancer, uh, I came up with the phrase, fight like a band. And originally it was fight like a man. I'm gonna fight like a man. This is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand up and we're gonna do what we gotta do and we're gonna, we're gonna beat this thing. And, and then I, the, the marketing genius in me decided, oh, fight like a band. Oh, that's even better because that's a new cool phrase that nobody's ever used. Yeah. So I, I li literally wrote the story of the her being diagnosed. And then I, I wrote the story about us going to Hollywood back in the 80s and, and living that dream on the Sunset Strip. And it was a very personal album for me from an expression point. Songs about working hard. Songs about going through good times and bad times. and Songs about real life. And real life is always going to be there for you. You have to draw inspiration from it. That's where the, the method has to go to the side. And you have to open your radar and be receptive to thoughts, feelings, emotions, and translate those. You'll find that if you have a list of potential song titles that you think are strong titles, like Fight Like a Band, or uh, 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 any, any of the other ones on the Fight Like a Band album, you'll find that if you just sit there with that title and you find the music that fits that chorus, the verses will follow. And you kind of got to go where they lead you, and you realize that everything that you write isn't going to be the best song ever. You have to just create it and put it out, and hopefully you end up with enough good ones for an album. That's the challenge that we're going through now. To follow up fight like a band with a new original album is going to be a huge challenge, but I felt the same way after Metal Cowboy in 2014 because that was the first time in my career that I'd written all the songs on the entire record. It was the first album that ever said, 
all songs written by Ron Keel. And I thought that was really a, a huge accomplishment personally from a songwriter standpoint, because they're all, in my opinion, really good songs. So I thought, man, there's no way I can follow this. How do I, how do I follow this one? And you just dig deep and you spend long hours in a room like this with the, these guitars and you just fight and you, you, you power through it. And every now and then you'll write two or three good ones in a day. And then you might go three months without coming up with anything that's worth a damn. So it, you have to realize that the well is not dry. Just not today is not your day and come back and try it again tomorrow. Have you had a song that years ago you thought this isn't worth a damn and then now you, you're working on something and all of a sudden it's perfect? You know, the, uh, the actual completed songs that I did back in the 80s, I was not a fan of, especially the songs on the Steeler record. I had a song called No Way Out, which was uh, one of the songs that we co wrote with Ingve. I think it was the only song on that record that Ingve wrote music, and I wrote some melodies. I didn't write all the lyrics, but uh, I always thought it was a piece of shit song. I just never liked it. I thought, man, it's just garbage. So last year we're doing Keel Fest, the uh, reunion show where I, I had all three of my bands on the same bill. I had yeah. the Ron Keel band, Steeler, and Keel, all one night, one show, three hours nonstop. And so to to do a, a ballad Steeler reunion with Rick Box on bass, who played on the Steeler album, and Mitch Perry on lead guitar, who replaced Ing Bay and Steeler, we've got to do as many of the songs off the album as we possibly can, because I think there's only eight or nine songs on the record, and we had to put a show together with that stuff. So I had to do a couple of songs, No Way Out and Down to the Wire, that I wasn't a big fan of, and I really hadn't listened to them in a long time. And I fell in love with them all over again after 35, 37 years when I was in rehearsals. I was you know, drilling those songs again. And then you decide, well, man, I, it's not a bad song, the guy just didn't know how to sing back then. Maybe we should recut this, you know. So I'm at that stage now where I want to go back and redo all the old albums now that I know what the hell I'm doing. Let, well, you know that that's an interesting thought because as fans, we we all the time are taking our favorite band and going, man, wouldn't it be great if they took that album from 40 years ago and re-recorded it now? And part of me as a fan is like, yeah, that would be cool to hear it. But then the other part of me is like, well, all the magic will will never be there because you can't recreate it. Do you, does, does that go through your mind when you sit there and go, well, man, I'd love, I'd love to re-record that Steeler album, but then does part of you go, but you know what? It's special as it is. It might oh, not garbage. be great, no, but it's, it's special. Yeah. Uh, the, the fans love, and I appreciate what that record did for my career and the, the special place in the hearts of our fans and, and, uh, followers that, that that album means a lot to a lot of people and I don't want to I don't want to piss on that but there are some songs that I've re-recorded that I, I can't I mean, Tears of Fire is is a perfect example off the Fight Like a Band album because we redid four Keel songs on yeah. last year's Fight Like a Band album I'm going to keep that going by the way on the next Ron Keel Band album there will be some new recorded versions of uh, some of the Keel classics and some of the Steeler songs I just feel First of all, I dig it because I get to take another shot at it. I get to revisit that, and, and uh, uh, it's a huge challenge for me vocally, but also it's very rewarding to hear the new version of Tears of Fire, which is great. Uh, the vocal, to me, is, is just light years ahead of the original. And, yeah, I know we all love the original versions. and They're special, and there's magic. and There's not a whole lot of – there, there's magic, but because those songs were part of the fabric of our lives – and when you're doing a cover album or a cover song, whether you're covering your own song or somebody else's, it's your job to recreate that magic and make it special all over again. But but can you can you see from a fan's perspective um, why they feel the way they feel about some of those songs? Because you put it out, so it's like once you put your art out everyone's going to maybe view things differently. I, I mean, every time I see Robin Zander, I'm like, you going to play up the Creek for me tonight. Every yeah. time he just, every time he looks at me like I'm nuts. 
and and like they will not play that song and that is one of my absolute favorite cheap trick songs and i can't imagine it isn't any different for some of your fans that like some of these classic things so is it hard for you to understand why they love a song that you recorded that you maybe just don't think is you know uh it is hard for me to understand. If it sounds better and it's played better and it's sung better, and it, it uh, that's why we keep remaking old classic films. I mean, the new versions are 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 great. Doesn't mean I don't love the original Star Trek, man. I'm a huge Trek fan. I watched that first episode in 1966 when the Starship Enterprise was first in everybody's living room. I loved it, but I've loved every incarnation of that. And I, I'm a big fan of the recent Trek movies as well. They, even though somebody else is Captain Kirk, uh, to me, it's I think it's I think it's fantastic. If it's quality and if it's great and if it's, if it doesn't matter uh, if it's uh, been done before or I don't, I don't really totally understand it because it sounds so much better than it, but, than it used to. It doesn't mean the original's not great. It's just here's a new version that sounds even better. But I think part of it too is is because you're looking at it from the eyes of the person who created it, wrote it, sang on it, and all of that. Whereas I think some of the fans, that version is just such a piece of their life because they rem remember driving around the lakes, listening to those songs or going out on a date or hanging out with friends. I think there's a there's got to be an element of that to it as well. The song's great. The song's great. Right to Rock is great. It's a great song. The vocal on it now is better. It doesn't make it any better or worse of a song because I re-recorded it three times, actually, with Keel in 2010 on the 25th anniversary reunion album and then again with Ron Keel Band last year. Still a great song, uh, just a different version. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think because that's always the thing. It's like sometimes when I talk to musicians, they're very receptive when you mention something that means a lot to you, even if it was like the elder. And then other people, it's it's like they don't, they, they 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 just know they could have made it better in their own mind, and I'm standing here looking at it, going, it, it, "But it's already fucking amazing." Yeah, you well, know? maybe I don't think I could have made it better back then. I just wasn't that good back then. I had some redeeming qualities as a singer, but I had a lot to learn, man. I had a long way to go, and I've had a lot of practice the last 35 years. And yeah, there are things that I've done in my career that I've. To me, it's not the song. I, if I love a song, I love the song forever. But when I hear a vocal that I did in 87 that is absolutely killer, I I am not compelled to sing it again. I think you're right. I'm not compelled to, man, I wish I needed a shot at that. If it's a great vocal, if, you know, if it's a song that, that I thought I did well on, yeah, I'm cool with it. Leave it. Don't. But there are songs like Cold Day in Hell from the Steeler album. Here Today, Gone Tomorrow from the Final Frontier album. I think some of these songs, I am going to redo them. I'm going to put them on the new album. And not necessarily for the only reason that I want to be self-indulgent and take another shot at it to satisfy my own uh, creative or musical taste. But I also think it's important because I've gone through all these twists and turns in my career, my musical evolution, reinventing myself. I think it's important for me to show and prove to the fans that I have not lost touch with who I was 35 years ago. I'm still that same guy. I've evolved, I've grown, I've matured, but I haven't forgotten my roots. Those songs on, on like a band, The Right to Rock, Tears of Fire, Because of the Night, Somebody's Waiting, they fit right into the context of the Fight Like a Band album. They don't sound like they don't belong. They sound right. like they belong on there, even though stylistically they're, they're a little more 80s or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but they all fit together. I think yeah. they do. I think they do. And I love showing the fans that, man, I, I haven't I haven't abandoned who I was because I did get that reputation. Unlike some other rock singers or metal singers that have branched yeah. off into other things, I got hit hard with that in 1995 when Ron Keel goes country was a huge hit on VH1 and MTV. Dee Snyder and Mark Striegel and everybody just throwing me under the bus because I sang country music. And even even though still so many people have done it since. That now it's this no music. big deal, but well, and this is but, but I got the reputation for excuse me I got the reputation for being a traitor and abandoning my roots. I never turned my back on who I was. I just added to it. I just grew. But that's so, stupid. That's music is music, you know. There's good yeah. country music too, and see, and that's the problem I have sometimes with some of the people that listen to the show. It's like metal or or nothing, and that's it. It's like no, there's Frank Sinatra. 
You know, there's other stuff that you can enjoy. But this is fascinating to me. Let's use uh, Cold Day in Hell as an example. So here you have this song that you'd like to take another shot at down the road. When you hear it, what is it that you what is it that you hear in it that makes you go, God, I want to I want to rework this. Is there something you could you can um, verbalize to people? It's vocal execution. It's knowing how to play my instrument better than I knew how to play it back then. More control over my voice, more comfort definitely in the studio after so many recordings and experiences and uh, training and practice and, and all the experiences that I've been through that I didn't have them. Uh, when we did that record, I was, I think I did the whole album in four hours. I was under the gun. I was under pressure. I was, wow. I was undergoing training with Elizabeth Sabine, the voice coach in, in Los Angeles, famous lady who uh, taught myself, Michael Sweet, uh, Axel Rose, Jizzy Pearl and myself, I mean, we all went to the same vocal coach. She was this little Australian lady, about five feet tall, probably 75 pounds, soaking wet. And she taught us all how to scream and belt it out. It was amazing. The training I received from her has been a constant companion throughout my, my, my live show, my vocal sessions in the studio and all that. But it took a while for me to apply that training to my style, to the voice I heard in my head, which was somewhere between, well, I, I wanted to be a combination of Paul Stanley, Rob Halford, David Lee Roth, and uh, Klaus Mein, uh, Sammy Hagar. Those are my favorite singers. And I wanted to somehow combine all those in my head. I just couldn't make this do it at the time. Now I can control it a lot better. And there's times in the studio, you might hear it every now and then. And I probably only do it once or twice per album. But I, I got to do my Klaus here. Klaus Mina from Scorpions. Go, God, one of the best tones ever. And every now and then I'll I'll get this thing and I I've got I got this little Klaus toe that I do and I, now I just set it up like Klaus give me another take and I'll try and Paul Stanley obviously was a huge influence on me yeah. I think you can hear that on the earlier records oh, even yeah. without even without Gene producing Paul was uh, certainly one of those singers that I emulated and sang along with in my early cover bands that his had. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to make this sound wrong because I'm a huge Paul fan and I cite him in my book and I, I told him in person a number, number of times what a special influence he was on me vocally. But the thing with Paul was it was stuff that I could pull off. It was stuff that I, I could I could sing his songs a little easier than I could pull off the David Lee Roth high screams or the Rob Halford piercing high screams uh, or the Brian Johnson ACDC grit. Paul was a a more accessible tone or voice, so I, I emulated that because I could, and a lot of his attitudes or inflections, you know, stuff like that. That was to me. I thought that was cool, so I, I injected a lot of that into my early recordings and my style at the time. So, so is it almost like when you're playing in cover bands and you're trying to find yourself, you have all these different um, singers that you love. Is it almost like Rich Little? Uh, during a, doing impersonations, like you, you figure out who you are and what your voice is by emulating these people, sounding like them to a certain degree, and then forming your own identity out of. I think so. I think so. And the guys that you really like, like the ones that I mentioned, Paul Stanley was huge for me. Um, David Lee Roth, who wasn't that great of a singer. I mean, the high screams and stuff, but David was more of a, a talker almost yep. at times uh, in his melodies. And the, I, I fell in love with Judas Priest and Rob Halford when I heard uh, Stained Class. That was the first Judas Priest record that I heard and just absolutely changed my world. And he was doing those high piercing screams on Beyond the Realms of Death and some of those songs. Then I went back and checked out the back catalog and Victim of Changes. Are you freaking kidding me? And it just Those high piercing screams were great. I thought, wow. You know, so I want to try it. I want to try some of that. And I'm in rehearsal with my guys in a band called Lost in Nashville. And the reason I, I gravitated to those high piercing screams, which were really cool. And, and uh, I had a little PA system, you know, two 12 inch speakers. And these guys are playing Marshall stacks. I'm competing with thunderous drums and Marshall amps. And I've got a little PA system. And the only time you can hear me. <laughs> was when I let out one of those big, high-piercing screams. I, the guys in the middle looked at me like, wow, what the hell is that? 
I thought, wow, that was cool. All right, let's do it again. So I started really overdoing it uh, in the 80s to the point of where uh, and I, I think it was cool. I mean, uh, that, that high piercing scream that uh, was uh, Rob Halford's trademark and some of those other 80s singers, uh, you know, I, I, I'm proud that uh, I was able to compete on that level vocally at that time. But I still had a lot to learn about control, about tone and pitch, harmony, execution, vowels, consonants, all the little mechanics and science that goes into it. It's like a quarterback throwing a football, man. Anything he's just throwing a ball. Man, there's a, a million different things that go into every aspect of his elbow, his shoulder, his hips, his feet. It, it's all, it's a science. I didn't understand that at the time. I was just a kid screaming a bunch of rock and roll. Now I understand. I'm still the same kid, you know, mentally anyway, but now I understand the science behind it. So, so if for many people, if you say, I'm going to take a guitar lesson, people maybe wrongly or rightly here assume, okay, well, you're going to go in, you're going to learn some chords, you're going to strum the guitar and maybe learn a song. But we've never really talked about vocal coaches or the art of working with your voice as an instrument. Can you give an example of what a vocal coach would tell you or like your first aha moment that still sticks with you that really change maybe the dynamic of some of the things you do? I, I can pass on all of that knowledge, and I have as a vocal teacher and instructor, especially to my subscribers at patreon.com slash Rod Keel, where I offer guitar sessions, vocal tips, and so forth. But it, it, there's a, a whole lot that goes into it, man. It's not like picking up a guitar. Part of it is just philosophy. My first so I'm spitting everywhere. I told you I spit when I sing. <laughs> or when I talk. Hey, man, I've got a glass it's, thing in front of me. I'm golden. It's, it's, you go right it's just ahead. water. It's just water. But um, part of it, a big part of it is philosophy and understanding where the voice comes from and why some people have them and why some people don't. And you guys got kids, right? I know, Mike, you yep. got, uh, Tommy, you got a beautiful family. Now, when they're uh, 12 pounds and their vocal cords are this big and their lungs are the size of a, a lemon, or smaller, they can still make these high piercing eh, 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 and they can hold it out forever. Eh, eh, eh. They can hold it out forever and never lose their voice. Why is that? It's not lungs, it's not the diaphragm, it's not the vocal cords, it's not training, it's emotion. It's that feeling that they're hungry, they're tired. It's an emergency. They've got to get your attention. It goes back thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. It's a genetic memory within all of us. If you can't be heard, you will die. You'll, the kids will get left behind. The kids would be in trouble or in danger in the tribe, the tribal setting. And if they couldn't be heard by their parents, they would die. We all have that. We all, I guarantee you, when we were all kids, when we were 12 pounds and had lungs the size of a, a lemon, we could belt it out like nobody's business. All kids do, right? Now, they, right. as we grow up, they teach us not to do that. Oh, you got to be quiet. Shh. we got to whisper. I don't whisper, man. I never whisper. As you can tell, I speak in what we call a connected tone at all times. It's a sharp, metallic type of presentation because guess what? I want to be heard. And that philosophy, first of all, to be a good singer... That's what you got to have. You got to want to be heard. You've got to learn how to control that diaphragm and that vocal mechanism, and also understand one quick breakthrough my teacher taught me when I was 22 years old. This only makes vowels. The consonants all come from the mouth. A B C D. Those are all mouth movements. A E I O O. The vowels come from the throat. That's it. Once you master the long and short vowels. You got it down. Then you ma manage to position that into pitch and control that pitch. My teacher, Elizabeth Sabine, God rest her soul, the same lady who taught me and Axel, Jizzy Pearl, Michael Sweet, little bitty thing. She could light a candle and then she would exhale all of her air. <sighs> she would blow those notes and the candle flame would not flicker. It's not air. It's not a saxophone, man. It's not a woodwind instrument. 
it is a vocal instrument. It's a matter of connecting your muscles in your body to not use any air. I don't breathe when I sing. That's why during an interview like this, every now and then I got to catch my breath because I'm worried. Yeah. But the, and you'll hear the difference in tone with singers like Steve Perry and Wilson from Heart. Uh, you can tell when the singer is using what I call a connected tone because it's sharp, it's metallic. That doesn't mean that sometimes you can't put some breath into it and some emotion, or sometimes you put the grit into it, like Ray Jensen. You know, you want to want to add that grit. I hope I'm not yeah. overloading the, no. the ear, earphones or <laughs> no, so, no, no, no. Um, you can add that grit if you want. I like it, but it is dangerous and harmful to the pipes. If you do that a lot, it's going to take its toll on you, like it has on Brian Johnson. But God, guys. You know, how old and still Sammy Hagar, perfect example, man, 70 something, 72, 82. I don't know how old the dude is, but he's still he's, he's still 25. He's amazing. He, yeah, it's he's amazing. amazing. And, he, you know, he sings properly. He sings well and he he wants to be heard. He's a great singer. So that to me is, is your basic vocal lesson 101 in a nutshell. Now that's a matter of warming up and I don't do all those scales on none of that crap. I don't do the <laughs> You don't, I know, that's how stupid is that? I'm just kidding. For all the singers that may do that, whatever works for you. And you, I have found that everybody is different. I mean, I've been with Ronnie James Dio on tour for months at a time, and Ronnie would never warm up. Ronnie never hit a note before he walked on stage. He's just, wow. He said, I'm wasting notes. If I do that, I'm just wasting notes. I'm going to give it to the crowd. Then he walked out there, and he, he was Ronnie James Dio. Of course, he's a superhero, but... I like to warm up just a little bit. Before I go on, I do some vowels. Eh, eh. You open and close the epiglottis, and you open and close. Eh, like, you, like you're drowning. And you close it and open it. Eh, eh, eh. You do a few vowels. Go through A, E, I, O, U. Do some scoops. Eh. And you just kind of move it up and down. And then you realize, OK, I'm cool. I got it. Let's go, let's go do the gig. I don't overdo it, but I just do a little tone check to make sure what I'm dealing with today because sometimes it's different depending on the climate or how much you've slept or how much you've talked. And you know, you can tell I, I talk from time to time. So it's different. You have to deal with it every day. And you kind of, sometimes you go out there and you realize this isn't exactly what I was hoping for today. And you have to kind of retrain yourself on the spot. You figure out during the first verse of the first song, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And then you adapt. You don't cheat. I don't cheat. I don't like to, to cut phrases short or, uh, you hold the mic out for the crowd to sing and crap like yeah. that, man. You know, I'll do that on a chorus. I'll have them do the right to rock, and then I'll do the next one. I don't have them do the whole damn chorus. I, I I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, so then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question. If you don't answer, it, you don't have to, and it's not meant in a bad sort of way. It's meant more out of passion. I, I I'm a big Motley Crue fan. So why why is Vince Neil doing what he's doing? He clearly still has the voice. I've heard it in pieces, but it's like he's to the point now where he just like walks through everything. How do you get there? I, I know you're not inside his head, but why does that happen? Oh, man, and that, uh, that he's not the only one. There's a few guys no, I know. out I'm there. I'm just using him as an example. No, because... a, it, it is a, a, an appropriate example. And I can I can see he having a bad night from time to time. There's a few gigs that uh, you know I haven't been my best, and I, I wish they yeah. weren't on YouTube. I mean, that, that's a bad night. Everybody has them. Yeah. Um, a bad decade is is a little bit more uh, serious. And why did you, you got to ask Vince that, man? I um, I do believe that uh, the voice comes from the heart, or the heart leads, the voice will follow. You have to want to be good. You have to want to sound good. You have to want to kick ass. And you've got to at least want either either the fans will believe in you or you'll pull the wool over their eyes and make them think you're as good as you used to be, which is what I do a lot of the times. I get a lot of this, wow, Ron still got it. That's a huge compliment to me. And right. I don't have everything that I used to have. What I, I've got some different stuff now that I can offer in terms of my control, my my pitch, my tone, my power, my energy, my delivery of the song. But some of those high piercing screaming notes are out of my vocabulary now. I'm not sure why. 
Uh, but it is because with age, I'm 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 60. I'm pushing 60. You know, I'm yeah. 59. <laughs> but you got. I really want to sound good, man. I want well, yeah. to make those fans think that I still got it. And as long as they're saying I still got it, then I must still got. I got something anyway. I'm not going to go out there and. Um, why you have to really want to sound good? You have to work. You have to practice. You can't just walk on stage, you know, a couple times a week and. You got to. I practice every day. I sing two or three hours a day right here, where you see. I'm, I'm in heavy rehearsals every day. I've got to sing and play. I've got to run through the show, even when we're not on tour. Like the last two or three months, I have to stay in shape. I work out. I I try and eat healthy. Of course, I'll have a cocktail. Uh, I do smoke cigarettes, but uh, my health and my voice are certainly very important to me. And most importantly, I, I want to sound good. If anything prohibits me from sounding good, then I'm going to have to eliminate that out of my life. Ron, well, Ron, and, and, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. Like, I was just going to say, Ron, before we, we move on, because I definitely want to talk to you about your new album, South by South Dakota. This discussion about vocals has absolutely been fascinating to me as a fan. But answer me this. You know, you can have great training, great a great instrument, great skills, how much does just feeling it add to that delivery and that performance? Because, you know, we've, we've, we've heard the stories. You're in the studio recording a vocal, and, the you know, the producer's like, I didn't feel that one. What, what does feel it mean, and what does feel it bring to the song? It's your job as a singer to feel it, and it's your job to make everybody who's listening feel it. It's your job to make the producer on the other side of the – the control room, feel it. I can tell you right now, I haven't walked out of the studio in the last five years without a take. Uh, and you never know. You Maybe you can come back tomorrow and do it again and do it better. Sometimes I'll reserve that right to go back in. It's not because I'm not feeling it, man. I feel it all day, every day. Uh, I don't understand what it's like to not feel it. But vocally, you have to... It's it's a very live in studio are two diff, totally different environments, just two totally different uh, skill sets and totally different approaches. But the uh, the fact that uh, I'm not feeling it, I, I, I'm not I'm not going to the studio if I don't feel it. <laughs> I'll just call the guy. I've never done that. I I don't get not feel. How could I not feel it, man? It's who I am. It's in my DNA. I don't I don't I don't even understand the phrase. I'm not feeling it. And nobody, I can tell you, Mike, nobody on the other side of the glass, from Gene Simmons to my producer now, Mike Dresch, nobody's ever pushed the talk back by and said, Ron, I'm not feeling it. Nobody. They, it might suck. It might suck, but they're gonna feel it. <laughs> Well, and, and I didn't, go, go ahead, Tommy. I, well, I was just saying, I didn't mean to throw Vince under the bus. That was not my intention. I really genuinely like him, and I enjoy going to see him even as a solo act. It's just I've seen so much talk about it online with the Motley Crue tour coming up. That's why I wanted to bring the subject up. And, and, and maybe what you did is you hit the heart of it. You have to, You have to maybe want to really be there. Maybe he does or he doesn't. I don't know. I'm sure he's having a good time. And Vince is a friend of mine. I've known him since back in the day. And we've done a lot of cool stuff together. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you right now, he's enjoying the shit out of it. I mean, he, he's he's having a good time. He wants to be there. Well, and the and, last time I saw him, he was really good, I thought. But yeah. people. But my point is, is it's like people are still mercilessly ripping on him for, at sometimes, I think, no good reason. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, maybe yeah, it's just I, the I, world I, we live in now. That's tough for me. And as a vocal critic, I mean, I got the same questions a few months back when David Lee Roth started doing his residency in Las Vegas. Yep. And we all saw the footage of David Lee Roth and his vocalization. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, it, I don't, it's not who am I to pass judgment on my heroes, uh, guys like David Lee. And there was a time when David Lee was uh, the best front man on the planet. Uh, I saw him in Nashville, Tennessee in 1980, and it was me and the other lead singer. The other, there's two rock singers in Nashville in 1980, me and this guy, Bruce. Bruce had a, a band called Sniper, and I had a band called Lust. 
And we were like the ACDC Judas Priest, denim and leather kind of, you know. And they yeah. were the guys, Sniper was the Motley Crueish kind of, they would dress up in the scarves and the big hair and the pyro and all this. And uh, I thought, man, that's cool. I love their band. I thought, well, God, I want to dress up like that because I told you earlier, I like putting on a show. And I want to dress up and I want to do pyro and I want to have a light show. And the guys in my band were just, you know, they're just kind of standing there in jeans and t shirts. So I really wanted to steal this band. And Bruce and I went to see David Lee Roth and Van Halen at uh, Municipal Auditorium in Nashville in 1980. And David Lee Roth was at absolutely the top of his game. You know, the splits up the drum riser and the Jack Daniels. And I would have, your girlfriend. And, yeah. <laughs> man, and just those high screams. And all, David Lee Roth was like the bomb. It's just amazing. Yeah. In, inhuman, superhuman. And the yeah. guy next to me, Bruce, the Southern Singer, says, man, screw it. I quit. I'm done. He just, I, I can never do that. I quit. I'm done. And he quit. I said, dude, can I have your band? He goes, yeah, sure. And he, he bailed. He, I took his band and we became Steeler. That's how Steeler was born. I, the guy just absolutely never sang again. And I saw the guy, dude, that's what I want to do. I want to be just like that guy. That was really right. cool. And so he, he was, his dick was in the dirt and mine was fully erect. And I said, I want to do that. And I took his band and renamed it Steeler. From Sniper, it became Steeler. Well, so what happened to him? Who? The other singer. I don't know. I never sense. saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't show up at the next rehearsal. I was there with the mic stand center stage, brother. <laughs> oh, wow. Ron, wow. Ron, Ron let's, let's chat a little bit about your new album, South by South Dakota. Yes. It's a great record. Is, is it not a great record? I mean, look at that album cover. Upside, oh, down. upside down. There we go. Look at that there album cover. <laughs> it starts with the album cover, and then it starts with all the covers that are inside the album. Well, yeah. And thank you, Mike, for the great job that you've done on this, man. And it, uh, Now that I'm up to my neck in the promotions and really enjoying the record for what it is as a fan, as a listener, uh, it does have so many special aspects for me. It is, yes, it's a covers album, and I get that a lot. Uh, but the only reason it's getting pegged as being a covers album is because all these songs, or most of these songs, are timeless classics that have this very special place in the classic rock songbook. In 2004, I did a record in Nashville with my band Iron Horse, and I, I wrote or co-wrote three of the songs on the record. Out of the 14 songs on the record, they were all outside songs, but nobody had ever heard them before. So... That's not, quote, a covers record, is it? Because they weren't hits previously. But even though I only wrote two and a half of the songs on that Iron Horse Bring It On album, to me, it feels more like a covers album than this one does, because I was doing all the songs by the hit Nashville writers. And George McCorkle from Marshall Tucker Band uh, gave us a song that Marshall Tucker had never recorded uh, called The Best Move. And he wrote the song. I actually have the, the lyric sheet in the other room with his signature on it. And uh, so we got to cut a Marshall Tucker song that was never cut before, recorded by anybody. So, but we covered we covered the song. I didn't write it. Uh, even when I did the Keel songs on Fight Like a Band, I'm still covering Keel or covering songs from my previous uh, career days. So this album to me is uh, it's very special. It's different than anything I've ever done because we did not even intend on making a record. We didn't even know we were recording the first three or four days when we were just in the studio jamming Burton with Disaster by Marshall Duck or Molly Hatchet and uh, Fire on the Mountain and uh, the... Uh, I, the we, I think we, it's we, interesting we, you did Homesick. Homesick was the first Ron Keel band single back in 2017. And I was looking for a song to release as a single to establish our identity. We had just renamed or rebranded from yeah. the Badlands House Band. We had become the Ron Keel Band. And I thought, we got it. We got to cut a single. We got to do a video. We got to establish our brand as the Ron Keel Band. And I'm on the radio doing my daily two to attend to two shift on the air. And the song pops up on my playlist. Literally, I didn't, it was a computer generated playlist. And I had nothing to do with it. The song pops up. I heard it. And Oh, yeah, I remember that song. It's killer. This great double guitar riff, uh, yeah. singing singing about being on the road and being homesick. And it just it, it struck a nerve with me. And I decided that day we're going to cut it. And we remixed that version for the South by South Dakota record. But this album in its entirety is a, a scrapbook, an audio scrapbook of our, our last five years together. You've got the Henry Paul produced track, Ghost Riders in the Sky, which Henry Paul produced uh, for us in 2015. And then you've got the Credence Medley the live track that ends the album, 
which is a three-song Creedence Clearwater Revival medley, which was recorded live at our very first show ever. So yes. you've got all these elements and all these little bits and pieces of our history the last five years with a whole bunch of new recordings that were done last year during the Fight Like a Band. Well, session. you know what I, what, I, what I think is really great about the album is, and, and just so all of our listeners know, it's a Southern Rock covers album. It's all yeah. Southern rock tunes, which, as as a as a fan of metal and hard rock, I thought that was so cool. Who else has done that? Name me one other band that's a metal band that the lead singer has done a covers of Southern rock, and I thought that was such a fresh approach, an interesting take on things, and. As, yep. as you, as a fan, get to learn who Ron Keel is, you also learn this isn't just Ron Keel jumping on the Southern Rock bandwagon. Southern Rock is in your blood before Keel even existed. Well, yeah, I was born in Georgia. You know, the move to Nashville at the age of 17 is famous in my history. And the love of uh, bands like Skinner and the Allman Brothers and Molly Hatchett you know, that, 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 to me, uh, the Skinner One More From The Road live album was right on the turntable, right next to Judas Priest, Hell Bent For Leather, and that would, they, they spent a lot of time dropping on top of each other on that turntable back in the late 70s. Uh, when Skinner passed away, when the, when the plane crash happened, with Ron, Ronnie Van Zant died in the plane crash, and some of the other members of the Skinner family as well, I think that's the only time I've cried when a, when a celebrity died. I was uh, just a kid in high school, never got to see that lineup live. But then again, I did go on tour with Skinner in 1998 as their T-shirt guy. That's how big of a fan of Skinner I am. I uh, I had the opportunity to go out on the road with them as their merch guy. Oh, and nice. Went out there and uh, got to see the show for two weeks. I never even got to meet the band. I was just the merch. I was I was the first guy there. Had to count. They had 28 different items on their. They had fish and lures, Skinner fish and lures, and autograph this and autograph that, and all oh, tons of kind of rebel flag T-shirts and bandanas and 28 different items. And I, I'd, I'd get set up and I'd do the count and the inventory, and then I'd watch the show, and then I'd get slammed with thousands of Skinner fans at the end of the show, and I'd be the last guy to leave, trying to count out all the stuff and get the numbers right. Never did get to meet them, but I did have Ricky Medlock on my radio show a few years back, which was pretty cool, being a huge Skinner fan and Southern Rock yeah. fan. Uh, to have Ricky Medlock guest on my show was fantastic. It was a great interview, very compelling content, and uh, their their record "Last of a Dying Breed" had just come out, and it's it's a fantastic album. I love that that album. So I had Ricky on the show, and now of course I've had him on the show. Now I've got his phone number and his email address because he's been on my <laughs> radio show. And I wrote this song uh, for the Metal Cowboy record called "What Would Skinner Do?" And uh, I can't do it with the headphones on. Uh, I wrote this song called What Would Skinner Do on the Metal Cowboy album, and it's my tribute to Skinner, basically a southern rock anthem, one of the best songs I've ever written, and I'm really, really proud of that. Frank Hannon from Tesla played lead guitar on that one, and uh, I was really super proud of it. So I emailed it to Ricky. Of course, I, like I said, he's on the radio show. I've got his email address, right? So I emailed it to him. I said, dude, this is a song I wrote. It's on my new album, and it's my tribute to Skinner. It's called What Would Skinner Do, and it's just a great song. Hope you like it. Let me know. And so a few weeks went by. I didn't hear from him. And I thought we had, you know, I, I'm, uh -oh. I'm sure I'm sure he loved it and played it for all the guys, right? So I emailed him back. I said, Ricky, did you get that song I sang you? And he, all he said when he emailed back was, Yeah, I got it. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh. But but man, you know, I, I'm hoping at this point now, South by South Dakota's been out for a few weeks, and the red, white, and blue video, which we're extremely proud of. Is getting a lot of views and a lot of attention, and I just hope that uh, I hope that they see it, I hope they hear it, I hope that they approve, and I hope they know that uh, it comes from a place of a guy who grew up listening to their music and has followed their example in so many ways. Not only with the reinvention of myself, and those guys really are the ultimate street survivors, no pun intended. After all the adversity that they've overcome and the the deaths and changes and, and musical climate changing for the last 40 plus years 
they've overcome all that. And uh, I just hope they know that uh, I, I, I'm a huge fan and, and that I admire and respect what, what they've done for, for my life and for rock and roll culture in general as one of the greatest bands of all time. Have you heard from any of the artists that you've covered? Well, Henry Paul, obviously, from the Outlaws, right. produced the track right. that's on our record, The Ghost Riders in the Sky. And uh, so Henry and I maintain a, a pretty nice friendship, and I saw him here in Sioux Falls last year. My George McCorkle from the Marshall Tucker Band, who wrote Fire on the Mountain, was a dear friend of mine. As I mentioned earlier, he had written that song, The Best Move for Us, and we recorded it on the Bring It On album. And he used to come out to the clubs in Nashville and jam with us and, and became a good friend. George and I actually co-wrote Bring It On, the title track to that record. And he's passed away about eight years ago from cancer. Uh, but uh, I hope that he's upstairs listening. Uh, now, the uh, any I have not heard from anybody lately, but I, we did some shows with 38 Special and uh, met Donnie and the guys, and I've got some autographs in the other room to prove it a huge 38 special fan and that seems to be one of the fan favorites off the new record rocking into the night which it's really is you know it's it's, it's a, a great hard rock anthem rocking into the night it's it's a, it's a hard rock anthem well, with a little southern twang to it but uh, uh i would love to hear from them and i'd love to have any of them on my show to talk about the record and, and what it, what their contribution to my life has meant uh, we did pay all the licensing fees. And another thing with a cover record, you're doing somebody else's songs. I don't get any royalties as a songwriter. It's it's more expensive to, to do a, an effort like this because not only do you not get paid your songwriting royalties, you got to pay them. Right. So it, in that in that regard, it is much more expensive to undertake something like this, but it's worth every penny, man. I think it's a great record. I'm extremely proud of it and, and always will be. I'm I'm well, so happy you did um, Molly Hatchet, Flirting with Disaster. Yeah, I was thinking the right way. As, 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 oh. as a Southern rock fan, I've always felt Molly Hatchet was was always in the shadow. It was all, if you talk yeah. Southern rock, you talk Skinnerd and the Outlaws. Skinnerd and the Outlaws. And I'm like, but fucking Molly Hatchet could blow those bands off the stage. Maybe because Molly Hatchet is more of a hard rock, southern rock band. But their That's... image was weird, too, though. Like, we talked about this before. Like, the paintings on their albums are fantastic, but they're not anything like what you think they would it's, be. It's, it's, it's bar medieval barbarians. Frank Frazetta yep. or Boris yeah. Vallejo. Uh, yeah. Which, which I thought was pretty cool, because we have a... And then now it's not upside down. We have a, a pretty cool go. painting on the South by South Dakota record. Obviously, uh, the train motif has been a big part of, of what we do the last five years. We have a train built into the drum riser, which shoots smoke and lights up. And uh, the train train being the opening track on the record. The train motif has been uh, part of our theme since the inception. And the album cover, of course, I said, well, i got to have a train, right? Uh, the album cover for South by South Dakota has got to be a train. And so, of course, the all-night Google searches for photos or drawings or paintings of trains. And I could not find anything, man. It was all crap. It was like, I don't want just a picture of a train. You've, there's a lot of albums that have used the train motif. It's been done. Uh, I've got to find something that really just blows me away. And I found this online as part of a video game. And... I, I saw it, and I was just blown away by the, the, the train illustration. So, of course, I'm now I'm on a mission to track down the artist, and he doesn't have a Facebook page. He doesn't have a website. He is a, a reclusive, um, uh, just in the middle of nowhere in the south of France. And I finally tracked, found a a form to fill out, to message to him from an artist, uh, some kind of artist site. And I messaged him and it took a few days. He got back to me and I said, well, I'm Ron Keel and I'd like to license this piece of artwork to use as my new album cover. He goes, Ron Keel, I'm a huge Keel fan. I love it. I'm <laughs> listening to your music. And this guy's, he's a, a, a reclusive artist in the South of France. He goes, dude, I would love to work with you. I'm a huge fan. So, he, uh, he made us a hell of a deal, and now we have a great album cover. What an awesome story. That's so cool. Well, and the thing that sticks out to me, too, is I like how 
the songs like Michael was saying, they have a theme because it's Southern rock, which I grew up listening to. And it's cool that you can show people a side of you that isn't just metal per se, but you didn't just go and do, I don't know, sweet home Alabama. You chose stuff that's familiar to most, I would think. Although I always thought like homesick was very regional. Yeah. Um, It was not a single homesick. was No, it was on the Quintanella record. That's right. And but I like that approach because they're 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 familiar songs with people, but yet they're not the tired ones where you've just heard them so many times. Yeah, it, it did start with Burton with Disaster, getting back to the hatchet. That was one of the songs we did our very first day of rehearsal. I had kind of a, a blueprint and sent the guys some some cover songs just so we could get to know each other and kind of play together and get a vibe going because we didn't have any original songs at the time except for the, you know, the Keel catalog or whatever. So her flirting with disaster was one of those songs we did the very first day in rehearsal. It's, we did it at our very first gig. I've got a live version of it that just smokes that was recorded that same night as the Credence medley. And that was the first song we cut for South by South Dakota, because we're in the studio on day one, we're in the studio all set up. And finally you get the drums mic'd and you get all the guitars plugged in, you get your headphone mix and, you kind of get ready to, to carve tracks. And the producer, Mike Dresch, needs us to play stuff so he can balance levels out. Because guys always play harder and more aggressive when you're playing a song as opposed to just sound checking. So let's do Front of a Disaster. And we launched into that. And we played the song as a basically a warm up exercise to get levels in the studio. And then, yeah, you know, okay, cool. This is good. Let's go ahead and cut our album. And we started carving "Fight Like a Band" at you know that that same hour. At the end of the day, we're all spent. We're beat. Okay, we've gotten all the best you know results that we could possibly get. We cut two or three songs today. Let's just have a couple of cocktails and let's do "Rock Into the Night." Yeah, 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 a couple of beers, and we launched into "Rocking Into the Night," and that's how it started. After a couple of days of this, starting and ending the day with those Southern rock jams and warm ups, I think we did Train Train, Flirting with Disaster, Rocking Into the Night, some of the songs that we knew that were in our show already. And after a couple of days, I, Mike, the engineer, told me, uh, you know, I've been recording this, right? I go, Let's hear it. You know, play it back for me. And when I heard the tracks back, South, the, South by South Dakota was born. I knew we've got something special here. This is a bunch of guys in the studio just having fun with each other, playing music we really love. It's right. not intentional. It's extremely organic. Yeah, there's some slop here and there. I had to redo all the vocals. You know, I, I, I was just you know, doing a scratch vocal, just kind of for reference for the guys, not really focused or concentrating. So I went back in and re- recut the vocals. But at that moment, South by South Dakota was born. And then, after you get that first four or five tunes, you realize, okay, and I don't know where the title came from, but it was instantaneous, South by South Dakota. We're going to do a Southern Rock tribute record. Now, we're going to include one song from each one of these bands. We've already got the Hatchet, the Blackfoot. We've got the Outlaws track in the can, Ghost Riders. We cut a few years back. We got Homesick. I mean, we had a, a very strong foundation for yeah. this album. And then, okay, what are we missing? You've got to have a Skinner song, right? I mean, right. you're not going to have a, you're not going to cover every one of those iconic bands without a Skinner song. Red, White, and Blue had been in the show already. Uh, as one of my favorite songs that I love to perform and sing. The guys in the band all knew it. And it was one of those Skinner songs that not everybody does know. Uh, It hasn't been played to death. And and it hasn't familiar. uh, And a lot of times when we would play that song in our show, I would say, this is some Leonard Skinner music for you. You know, I'd let the audience know that it's not ours because otherwise a lot of them wouldn't know. A lot of them hadn't heard it. And so we we decided to cut that one. Of course, you got to have an Allman Brothers song, right? Uh, you can't do a Southern Rock tribute record without one Allman Brothers track. So then I did tread on sacred ground. I went to their biggest signature hit, the Allman Brothers Sweet Home Alabama, Rambling Man. Right. And uh, because I knew it, because I already knew the song. I was, kind of, I was cheating. <laughs> you want to have to learn the tune. Because from a lead singer standpoint, it's 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 a little easier than it is. With all the, the guitar players, those guys had to work on it. But also the, the lyrical content really hits home, you know, Born in Georgia, my daddy was, you know, it, it, I was born in the backseat of a Greyhound right. bus, all that stuff. It's almost the biography of Ron Keel. So the, the lyrics really hit home for me. I've been doing it in my solo acoustic gig, 
and I knew the song already. So I put it on. The guys listened to it a couple of times and hashed out the riff and realized, oh, shit, man, this is in A flat. I thought it was in G. And G is an open key. G, you can play, you know, the old big open chords. A flat. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you, everything had to move up a half step. We had to transpose the song on the spot. I thought, well, let's just give it a try. All right? We listened to it a couple of times. The guys hammered out some parts. So what you hear on the South by South Dakota record is the first take. Oh, uh, top, top to bottom. Uh, and we had never played it. It wasn't a song that was in the show that we'd rehearsed before or anything. And just click the sticks and go for it. And we actually pulled it off. And so that's, that's a pretty cool moment for me to have that, that first take uh, on the record. And you can hear, you can hear some of the, and I don't know, I think the Allman brothers had a few uh, questionable notes in their version as well, because those guitar harmonies where they work the harmonies with the keyboard line and the bass line, there's a lot going on there. And it sometimes sounds like there's a wrong note here and there. in some of those parts, I thought, I'll just leave it, man. You know, I'll just leave it. I, I don't want to go back in there and have to auto-tune a guitar note or trying to have to recut it. Or, it's natural. It happened that night. It was it was magical. Let's just leave it the way it is. And every now, every time I hear it now, it, it kind of makes me cringe. But still, it's it's pretty cool. It's natural, and uh, it's the way it was meant to be. Ron, Ron, would you would you consider the Ron Keel band a southern rock band? I mean, you know, for lack of a better term, Michael. Uh, absolutely, because that term has been with me now for 20 years. It goes back to my days in Italy. I don't know that I've told you this story or not, but I, was, I lived in Italy for almost a year in 1998, 99. In fact, I spent the millennium when we went from into the 2000s. I, I spent that New Year's Eve playing at a club in Siganella, Sicily as the house band. And uh, I lived, drank a lot of wine, went to the beach often and played three nights a week in a club there with a little three piece band. And during that time, I started writing songs in the, the club had given me a whole huge warehouse room where they kept their storage of stuff they weren't using. So I set up my recording studio in this big warehouse and would go in during the day and I would write and I just pour my heart out and I'd write songs. And the guys in the band, we'd learn them and put them in the, in the gig. We'd play the, those songs live. And so before I left Italy, finally, every, all good things must come to an end. So I had to leave Italy uh, in March of 2000, and before I left Italy, I wanted to go in the studio and cut a, a demo, basically a, a memento of my time in Italy. These are the songs I wrote while I lived in Italy. And I went in the studio, and we cut the tunes, and I, I burned a CD and went to the bar afterwards. Of course, I went to the bar. Went to the bar afterwards where we played and told the bartender, hey, man, put this on the CD player and play it over the system. And there was a combination of Italian people and U.S. Navy service men and women there. So it was right across from the Navy base. So you get all kinds. You get a lot of Italian locals and nationals that didn't speak any English. And you get all these hardcore American Navy guys and girls that, you know, love the party. And people started commenting on the music that they're hearing. The guy on the left of me says, man, that rocks. That rat kicks ass. That fucking rocks. And the guy on my right says, man, I sound like good country music. I love country music. And everybody had a different reaction to it. This guy thought it was rock. This guy thought it was metal. This guy thought it was country. And I'm going, Man, I've, I've got something here. I've got this. This is me. This is who I am because I never was comfortable in either, totally comfortable in either genre. I had one foot on either side of the fence the whole time. And to find common ground between the two musically was a landscape that I felt very, very comfortable in. And immediately at the time, the band Iron Horse was born. I moved back to the States and put Iron Horse together. And I called it at the time, you know, I wanted to create this hybrid. Uh, you know, we had an international lineup of guys. Robert Marcello from Danger Danger was the lead guitar player. Mm -hmm. And Gino R.C., who's still in Ron Keel Band to this day, 22 years later, is still the bass player. And I wanted to create this hybrid. And I called it hard rock and southern country metal. You know, whatever. I would come up with these descriptive terms. What kind of music do you play? I play hard rock and southern country metal. But for lack of a better term, when people heard it, what did they call it? Southern rock. Southern rock. Sounds, like, sounds like Southern rock to me. Sounds like Southern rock. You mix metal and country, and that's what you get. Exactly. You get, you get the metal cowboy, and you get Southern rock. So it's a descriptive term that lets you know exactly what you're in for. I embrace the term. I do believe 
first of all, I was born in Georgia, like I said. I spent a lot of time in the South, in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, I do believe that the genre itself has been restricted geographically because it's not just about the Southern United States. It is the music of the people. It is music that resonates with hard work and hard partying people all over the world. I proved that in Italy for eight months when I was playing yeah. this kind of music. The Italians didn't speak a word of, of English. They didn't know if I was a rambling man or, or what, or red, white, and blue, what the hell is that? They just loved the, the sound. They loved the feeling, the energy. The, the, uh, it, it combines the best of arena rock and metal with songs for the common man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably a great way to say it. And and it, like I said, I grew up on that stuff. So for me, it's it's a walk in the park of familiarity. You know, yeah, that's my park, yeah. and you're welcome anytime, Tony. I appreciate Thank that. You. I feel Thank I feel you. very it's... comfortable with it. And uh, I, I'm so in love with the record. It's one of the. It's very liberating to create an album that I didn't write because I don't have to. It, it kind of sets me, I can listen to it as a band because I love the songs and I'm really proud of the performances and my voice and all that stuff, but I can listen to the record as a band. I really enjoy this this album, extremely proud of it. And I can do interviews and say, these are great songs. I've never been right. able to do that before because I always had to be humble and say, well, you know, these songs came from the heart and they mean a lot to me. I hope you enjoy them. You know, screw that, man. These are great songs. <laughs> well, you know what? Well, it, 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 it's not like you're trying to reinvent yourself and appeal to a new audience to survive which is a, is how a lot of people will perceive somebody going from rock to country it's like oh your rock career is over so you've got to go to country for you that isn't the case you're not reinventing yourself this is yourself this has always not, been yourself I, I reinvented myself 20 years ago but you know some of my favorite artists that i have admired and kiss is one of them it's consistently reinvented themselves with different looks, lineups, and musical styles. And David Bowie, uh, yeah. famous for reinventing yep. himself. Queen yeah. had no, and I didn't even realize this until I saw the Queen movie. I'm obviously a huge Queen fan, and, and Freddie Mercury is one of the greatest of all time, and Brian May, and Queen is, is, is huge to me, but I didn't even realize until I saw the movie how diverse they were. They had no boundaries. They had no fences around their music. They could play disco, metal, pop, classical, opera, all of that. It was all, all good ideas were fair game with a band like Queen. And so to me, reinventing yourself isn't a crime. It's not a bad thing. And I get, I get asked this a lot by people. Uh, in fact, a wildlife journalist, his name's Chester Moore. He's a new fan at patreon.com slash Ron Keel. Let me plug that. One. He's a new fan. He wanted to ask me. You know, these I give my fans personal con consultations, and I talk to him about this. He's he's a wildlife journalist. who's re, you know he's reinventing himself in a new field for a new audience. Is how do you do it? How do you re, how do you consistently reinvent yourself and evolve? And, and I was, the the thing is, you never subtract. You don't take away what you had or who you were. You just add to it. That's how you reinvent yourself. And you hold on to who you were and where you came from and your roots, are they, they go deep. You don't have to pull up those roots and plant them somewhere else. You keep that. That's part of you. That's who you are. But it doesn't mean you can't add to it and grow and evolve. So then how is it? Because you seem really comfortable in your own skin. But how is it that some people allow themselves to get so locked in to something like what comes to my mind in like I like Metallica. Okay. I like and justice for all. And I like the black album to me, they sound the same because yeah. they're good songs written by a band that I like, but they were just crucified for a while when that black album came out being called sellouts and all of these, these types of things. Do you think that being in a certain type of band, you're almost Painting yourself into a corner because of the kind of music you make. Metal bands, the metal bands are especially brutal. Trust me, I know for a fact. But metal itself has reinvented itself over and over again. When I was a metal metalhead, a metal band, and I'm still a metal 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 band. It, to me, it was Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and uh, Motorhead, uh, even bands like Def Leppard, Scorpions. We we thought they were metal at the time. 
They were outside the mainstream. They did not uh, get played on the radio. I mean, Saxon, another one. Uh, yep. Some of those bands that, that to, to, to us, and Saxon, they had some great commercial rock anthems. For us, it was metal. Now, metal is something totally different. And it's even, obviously, there's so many sub-genres and different classifications of what is metal and what isn't metal. Uh, and I think the metal bands are, uh, and not all of them, because I, I can tell you right now, I see the order sheets for South by South Dakota. I see every name that comes through the, the pipeline that's ordering my new record. There's a lot of metal fans buying this new record. I'm really surprised to see some names that I haven't seen in a long time ordering this new album. And to its credit, it is a Southern rock album, as I said. But I think comparing it to Fight Like a Band, if you've never heard either album or any of the songs, I think this record is more metal than that one, and that's not intentional. It wasn't like, oh, we got to be heavy on this record. We were just trying to do the best we could and execute the songs, but we didn't have any commercial expectations. And my producer, Mike Dresch, and I, the record says produced by Ron Keel and Mike Dresch because I'm the ringmaster of the circus and I coordinate all the music and I coach the team, so to speak. But Mike is the guy who makes it sound great. And I, I gave him free reign to mix the record however he wanted to do it. Uh, just Mike sent me the mixes, and I would make very minor adjustments in the final process of, of mix down. Give me a little more guitar right here, maybe a little less of this here. Very minor adjustments. I let Mike mix it how he, he felt, and he had gotten some new uh, effects and some new, they call them plugins now with the Pro Tools software. Yeah. He got all these cool new toys on his, and he's a guitar player too, and he's a, he's a rock guitar player. And so, I think he wanted to just see how beefy he could make the guitars just because I gave him free yeah. reign and they came out really, really beefy uh, and very heavy on this record. It's the biggest snare drum sound I've had since the 80s. I tell you, that's the red, white, blue, that snare drum is Def Leppard-ish almost to me. So there are a lot of heavy elements on this record and I, I'm not sure if that's why the heavy metal fans are embracing it as much as they are or not, but... Uh, but, but why do they have a tendency to crucify some bands that step out of that spot sometimes it's versus not, any other genre? It's not just that, Tommy. It's country fans as well. They'll Are say, they? That ain't, that ain't country. You know, and I got this back in 1993, 95, 97, when I was focused on my country music career. You, know, you get everybody, that ain't country. You know, and, and at the time it was, you couldn't say the word ass. I said the word ass in a song. You're going to kick ass or something. I got crucified for that. That ain't country. You can't say it in a country song. Now I say it all the time. But country music is one of those as well that continues to evolve. 60s country is totally unlike 70s country, which oh, yeah. is totally unlike 80s country or 90s country, the Garth Brooks era. Modern country is not like any of those. You'll still hear some of those traditional elements. You might hear a fiddle or a steel guitar sometimes. But that style of music has been, uh, you have to continue to, to build your audience and gain new fans. Uh, I can't stay in business by just pleasing the fans that bought my records 30 years ago. People aren't like that. People are right. going to go to different restaurants. They're going to watch different movies. They're going to embrace different songs or artists. I get that. Just because you, you didn't buy the new South by South Dakota album doesn't mean I don't love you because you bought the Steeler album. That's totally cool. That's if, if you love that record and that's all you ever bought, that's totally cool, man. I appreciate you. And thanks for being a part of my life and a part of my, my dream. But I've got fans that the Rontourage.com is a fan group. These kids are 25 years old. They call them, they call themselves the Rontourage. That's and awesome. The Rontourage. They're, 20, they're 25. They never heard of Keel. They weren't even born back then. Ron, right. Keel, band, Ron Keel Band is their favorite band in the world. Yeah. And that's cool. And I, I, I entertain them on this, with the same passion that I'll entertain the, the Sealer fans or the Keel fans. And you hope to hold on to as many of the old fans and drag them along with you as you possibly can while you're continuing to build your new fan base. And you're going to lose some of those people that are going to that don't get it or don't care. And that's okay. It's not their thing. It's not their, their cup of tea, so to speak, or, or shot of whiskey, whatever it might be. That you have to continue to build new fans. And 
I, I do it predominantly for myself at this stage of the game. I have to please Ron Keel. I have to right. be happy with my music, my product, my shows, my interviews, everything that I do. I have to go to bed tonight going, yeah, man, I kicked ass with three sides of the coin today. That was a good gig. Whether some people might be watching and not agree with me, I can't control that. My job is to create. My job is to express myself and let it fall where it may. And the fact that I sold 3 million records means that billions of people don't like me or don't want what I do, and I'm cool with that. Well, so then this is a perfect segue then before we, we end this for you to tell us or share with our audience because that's one thing I think you've been extremely effective with is being – everywhere as far as all of the different social media things you're doing so where how can they connect with you if they don't already know give us a little breakdown of different things well i'm a firm believer in the conventional website i built ronkeel.com 20 years ago on my first computer and you know facebook i remember back then you had to have aol instant messenger right or you couldn't do business if you didn't have aol instant messenger and you had to have uh you had to have Napster, right? I mean, without all the fans had to have Napster. Yeah. Like MySpace, when we got signed to Frontiers in 2010, it was mandatory on our product that you had to have your MySpace address on the album cover and on every piece of promo. The, the photos from 2010, the Keel reunion, say myspace.com slash Keel band. It was mandatory. And then all of a sudden we woke up one day and it wasn't cool anymore. And I, I love that Michael Brandvold is... is uh, it has given me the opportunity to explore and exploit some of these social media platforms and get more involved with Spotify. And because I had I a bad a bad taste with Spotify when I got my first three cent check from them, like screw them, the three cents? Are you kidding me? But man, you got to embrace it. You got to embrace it. You got to get on board. This is where everybody's going. I want to go with them. I want them to come with me. So you you got to embrace that. But that website ronkeel.com is your portal to all that other stuff. The Patreon membership site, which I'm extremely proud of. I built that online platform when I went into quarantine three years ago when my wife was diagnosed with cancer. All of a sudden, I've got a, a, a cabinet full of surgical masks. You know, three years ago, before any of this crap, because when somebody in your house gets cancer, you've got to be very careful. They have a, a lower immunity and a high risk of infection. You've got to keep the doorknobs and the light switches and the remote controls all spotless and clean. And we, we, we got into the habit uh, of doing that then. And I had to find a way to entertain people online because I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to tour that year. And when maybe, maybe I won't be able to tour again, what's going to happen. You just don't know. So I built the Patreon page so that I could interact with the fans online. We do live chats, just like the what you guys and I are doing right now. We have guitar sessions, Vocal lessons like the one I gave you earlier. Uh, songwriting courses, I'll take take the fans through my songwriting process with video and audio. Uh, unreleased demos of songs, live concerts, both live online concerts and video from back in the day that you're not going to see on YouTube or Facebook. All that stuff. So I'm really, really proud of that Patreon platform. Now it's out of control because the last three months and everybody's been locked down. They've all come over to my house at patreon.com slash Rod Kill. It's like having a thousand people knocking on your door nonstop. <laughs> it's a blast, but it's overwhelming. Uh, but you can get to all that stuff, the Spotify, the social media, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the videos, YouTube, all that through one portal at ronkeel.com. And you can buy the, the new CD there and listen to uh, the uh, the Spotify streams and, and all the other stuff that uh, – that we're trying to, to offer the fans to make it easy, make it one click away. And then when, once you're there, you can explore the other aspects of my, my presence. Listen to the radio show. You um, know what? I'm, as I'm listening to Ron, I'm like, man, we have had some amazing storytellers on in the last month or so. Yeah. Ted Nugent, Dennis DeYoung, Ron Keel. I mean, I was just riveted by by all of their their conversations and you know what all three yeah. of them had in common is you just needed to get them started and man they can just talk and i'm not saying that in a bad way they no. are skilled at telling stories well and very diverse topics none of them are the same they're very you know what i mean all different points of view so like i'm not a singer we've talked about this but that Vocal stuff was fascinating to me because oh, we've agree. never talked about 
yep. anything like that before. Yeah. No, I found that so fascinating as, as a fan to sit here and, you know, I, I've always understood that, yes, it, it's a muscle and there's different ways of doing it, but I've never had it really explained to me to the way that now I'm like, okay, I can understand what you're talking about and I can understand the skill and the training and the exercises and why that's important. You know, it's it's just like you get somebody comes on and talks about being a guitar teacher. You know, there's a skill to playing a guitar. There's a skill to singing. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so Ron's, you know, Ron's one of the good ones, man. Yeah, and for sure. What a super nice guy. Super and, and nice guy. Very deserving guy. of your time. And, so, and, and, guys, check him out. Check, Yeah, please check him out. I mean, he his, his love for Southern Rock is real. It's in his heart. Um, mm -hmm. It's a passion. It, it's it's not a ploy to just do a new record. This is cool stuff. I mean, when, when he sent it to me um, just before I started working with him, I was just like, oh, this is this is cool. This is really cool. It's it's a different take in a sense on doing a covers album. It's not yeah. because you know, I think a lot of people could sit here and go, oh, Ron Keel, maybe he'll cover a Kiss tune and he'll cover a Black Sabbath tune and he'll that cover exactly and, and, and he'll point. cover a Led Zeppelin tune and you know a Priest tune. It's like that that's expected. I think yeah, in he some did the sense unexpected. he did the unexpected Southern rock, which you know, the way he described how, you know, the the people in Italy were talking about his songs was like, yeah, to me, Southern Rock, especially the 38 specials and the Molly Hatchets, mm -hmm. are hard rock Southern Rock, if, if yeah. that makes sense. They, they lean more towards the hard rock side, whereas somebody like Skinner and the Outlaws might lean more towards the countryside. Yeah. And we, you and I both grew up on all that stuff. So those songs are, are really important to the fabric of my musical taste as well. Like I said, I was really excited when I saw Homesick. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, I, it just, it, I don't know. I just think it's very creative. So get out there and support them and also support our buddy, Mark Cicchini, uh, with his latest venture, Left for Dead, um, which it should probably be aptly named at this moment, Left for Dead in a food coma. Le left, left for a food coma let's just leave it at that yeah yeah because literally as we are speaking mark had texted us a photo of then this was about an hour and a half ago the first plate of crab legs at the all you can eat buffet it, it reminds me of that scene in the monty python movie give me a fucking bucket <laughs> you know <laughs> or or uh the 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 Oh, what, what's the um, Austin Powers movie? Yeah. Get, get in my belly. <laughs> totally. He's the only guy I know that will fly three hours from home just to have dinner. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and love it. And absolutely love, love it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, listen, I envy him. If I was sitting at an all-you-can-eat crab place, I'd be loving it too. But, well, you know, yeah. you know, you know, Mark is literally killing it there. We must see him walk in and go. Oh, God. The, the the manager on duty is like, sir, all you can eat doesn't mean all you can eat. Bring me plate <laughs> ten. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, and we've talked about before. I've gone to um, like uh, they have all you can eat crab legs in Minneapolis at the or but not right now, but um, at the Mystic Lake Hotel. And they're actually the large king crab legs. And man, do those people get aggressive. Oh, yeah. And it's like, they just, they, came, they, they keep bringing out literally big metal trays filled with them. They're not going to run out. It's the seafood seafood buffet night. And people get like, you know, hip checking, a little aggressive to get at those, those legs. So I, this is something I think I'd like to see sometime with him. I think sometime we need to do a show at a casino buffet. Yes. And we can film them going into a food coma. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be fun. We'll have to we'll have to figure that out. So, um, you guys, what are we gonna do for homework? H homework. Um, you know, have, have you have you heard have you heard um, the new Ron Keel band South by South Dakota? If you've heard it, what do you think of it? Um, 
you know, are you a fan of, of Keel, of Ron Keel? Are you a fan of Steeler, of all of, of Iron Horse, any of the incarnations that Ron has had through his career? Um, you know, what what do you think? Did you, en- yeah, did you enjoy the conversation about the vocal stuff? Yeah. I'm yeah, I think, I think there's because plenty the there. There's plenty there for you to talk about. So, yeah. you know, that 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 that's your homework. Talk about Ron. Let us know what you think. Did you learn anything? Do you like the music? Um, you know, have you seen Ron Keel Band lately? And yeah. Of course, they've been off the road since March, but they're going back out now. So finally, finally, um, yeah. You know, I think that's good homework. Head over to facebook.com slash three sides of the coin. Leave your answers there. And, of course, if you are watching us on YouTube, hit that red subscribe button so you don't miss another episode. Spotify, follow us. iTunes, subscribe and leave us a review and rating on iTunes. Um, It's all greatly appreciated. And one more time, go check out Left 4 Dead. They're available Apple Music, iTunes, Deezer, Pandora, Spotify. Quick update, because a lot of people are asking where the CDs are. Still working on it. It's an issue with Amazon, with all the stuff going on with COVID right now. They are very slow in setting up and delivering the on-demand CDs. So just going to have to be patient for the CDs. Yeah. So hang in there. Hang in there. It's coming. And uh, it'll take five years. <laughs> God, the gift that keeps on giving. I, I think Izzy will love the fact that that's that's replaced Seven Eleven pasta, probably. Yeah, but I still think it when he like he mentioned the other day in a post that uh, uh, Olive Garden is awesome. Just deal with it. And I'm thinking better than Seven Eleven. Who would ever go to Izzy for advice about food? I mean, come on. Although he does does have some um, pretty impressive barbecue skills, I think. Yeah. Well, a picture and actual, how does it taste? That's well, that's the thing. thing. I, I, I've never tasted it, but I suspect it's good. But knowing him, he probably could smell his neighbors bar- barbecuing. They go inside to get a beer. He sneaks over there, takes a picture of what they're grilling, and goes, "Hey, man, look what I'm making for dinner." <laughs> oh, yeah, we love Izzy. We love him. Yeah. We're actually going to get him on the show in the next few weeks. Yeah, he's got some great. stuff he wants to talk about and promote. Uh oh. Um. All right, that's it. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.